Greetings, folks. Activate Worcester. I believe this is episode number 94. I can't believe it. Uh, we get paid, what, 100000 an episode or so. <laughs> so this is just let the hits keep on coming. And, folks, speaking of hits or misses or whatever, communicate with us about the show, things you like, things you'd like to see improved and or changed, and any suggestions that you might have for future guests. This is an interactive station, interactive show. Uh, interact with us and we'll respond, I guarantee you. Uh, speaking of responding, we're filming this on October 15th, and it probably won't be seen until the last week of the month without a heck of a lot of time before a very important date, Tuesday, November 4th. This is a huge, huge election cycle for the people of Massachusetts. We have a, gu a gubernatorial race, which is neck and neck. And we have many, many other races at the state level that are also very, very important. And right here in Worcester, lots of important races. None are any bigger or important than the state Senate in the first Worcester district. And this is one heck of a district because it encompasses about three quarters of Worcester. It's Northborough, Clinton, most of West Boylston, Princeton, Boylston as well, and of course, Holden. All of those are all included. And we have a gentleman who's been on our show several times before in, in different situations. And he is a very aggressive candidate running as a Republican for the job. And what I want to do is, without further ado, as they say, I want to welcome a good friend of the show and of us personally, Paul Franco, to the show. Paul? Hi, Ron. Great Hi, seeing uh, you again, Guy. Great seeing you again. Thanks, Ron. Thanks for having me. And thanks for all the listeners uh, taking the time to hear me out. And uh, I enjoy uh, the opportunity to speak to you all today. We're glad to have you. How has the campaign been going? I know you've been running hard literally from, from the, the, the sound of the first bell with this. How's it been going for We're you? going very well, Ron. Uh, we've door knocked on over 10,000 doors. The reception Jeez. we're getting is phenomenal. We have teams from Clark University, Doherty High School, Wachusett High School, some of the other colleges working their tails off uh, doing the door knocking. We're beginning our phone banking in, uh, next week, and we're trying to get out the vote. Uh, the reception we're getting to our message is resonating with the voters. They like what they hear, and for the first time in a long time, even Democrats, you know, staunch Democrats are coming up to me and saying, Paul, we're going to vote for you for the first, we're going to vote for you, you're going to be the first Republican I vote for in 20 some odd years. Mm -hmm. And I tell them I'll keep it quiet and uh, thank you, <laughs> thank you very much. And uh, we're hoping that the message resonates further and we bring it on, bring it on home on November 4th. Folks, if I can just interject something. Do yourself a favor this year <clears throat> on, on all sides of the aisles. Forget about the label. Forget about Republican. Forget about Democrat. Forget about Libertarian, pizza party. And there is a pizza party, believe it or not, that's recognized by the state. But the point is what you really want to do is look at the individual, look at what they're presenting for you. Are they, in fact, espousing what you want to see them talking about? And if not, Go the other direction. Vote against the other person. Uh, one thing you really need to do as a responsible voter is look at the track records of every one of the people that are running, whether they're incumbents, in other words, if they're in the job currently, or if they're people trying to get that job. Very, very easy to see what their voting records were. Don't listen to the smooth words that the political folks have them saying. Look at their records. Judge them by what they do, not by what they say. And I don't care if that's a Republican or a Democrat. I feel that way about every one of them. And Paul, in your case, you're going up against an individual who has been in the job for a very, very long period of time. Why should they be considering, even though you're a hell of a guy, why should they be considering a rookie? Well, I'll tell you, the reason I decided to run was because for too long I have witnessed a state government that is so out of touch with the hardworking families of the district, corrupted by power, uh, concerned more about self-interest and promotion than providing a means of upward mobility for all residents. 
Consider these facts. 62% of our young people are either underemployed, unemployed, or not looking for work at all. The number of jobs in this state is the same as it was in the year 2000. And in the past eight years, we have seen a 40% growth in our state budget, yet zero increase in the funding of our education in local Asia cities and towns. There's no new ideas, just tax, spend, and cater to special interest. Our plan for upper mobility has three elements, excellence in education, job creation, and transparent, efficient, and accountable government. And with your uh, permission, at, at some point during the show, I'd love to talk more about what we plan to do and why it's resonating so well with the voters of the district. One of the things before, I, you more than have, you have my strong endorsement to speak about those issues, because every one of those are, are relevant to myself and to the folks watching. One of the things I've noticed in your campaign, literally from the kickoff on, is the amazing preponderance of youthful people. Yeah. Uh, I keep hearing, oh, people are disenfranchised, the young folks just feel they can't make a difference, they're not involved, and so on and so forth. And that's exactly opposite of what I've seen. Why? Why are they supporting you? I think they like the message I'm presenting. I, I have a lot of those young people myself. My wife and I, <laughs> six we have six, <laughs> six children. We have one granddaughter. Um, we are very heavily invested in the community. As you know, all my kids have gone through the Worcester Public Schools. Yeah. Um, we have one still going to Forest Grove. Uh, uh, four, three of them have all gr already graduated from UMass Amherst. One's a uh, senior there. I've got my youngest boy, my middle boy, going to Bridgewater State. And I think the message of education is very important. And we've come up with some very innovative ways to not only bring better education to our young people, make it more, uh, but also make our secondary and post-secondary education more affordable. And I think the ideas that I've presented have really caught on with the young people because they're our future. They're the ones that need the jobs. If we want our young people to stay in the community, we have to give them a reason to stay. Mm -hmm. We have to give them the opportunities. And our excellence in education platform fits in nicely. Details. All right. Well, the first part is we need to make sure that any program of education empowers the principals with the, uh, with, the, uh, with the opportunities to create and mold their own staff. They need the, to be able to assemble their teams to bring the best education possible to our children. Okay. Uh, they need to have more technical high schools. Think about it. We have one of the best technical high schools in the country, but you could only get in by, uh, by lottery. So if there are individuals and families that want to send their kids for, for vocational training, the opportunity is limited. Mm -hmm. Why aren't they, why, why don't we have more technical high schools? Same with charter schools. Give our children and their parents the vast array, uh, array of opportunities. And one other program which I think is outstanding because one of the big problems facing the inner city schools is the children that are at risk, the children that don't perform well in that uh, regular academic environment. Mm -hmm. These are the kids that drop out early, the kids that don't succeed, uh, end up having disciplinary problems. Well, what we can do is we can use some out-of-the-box, forward thinking that some other cities and towns and co communities have done across the country. And one of those is called the um, uh, 12 for Life program. Now, just by real brief, a company named, uh, called Shockwire down in uh, uh, Georgia and Florida mm -hmm found that the graduates they were getting were not meeting the needs of their, of their industry. So they collaborated with the local school board and said, listen, give us the children that are not doing well in school. Let us get the uh, uh, teachers together. Let us teach them during the day and then let them go to school, let them go to work you know, as an intern and mm -hmm. get paid in the afternoon. So we'll take those disadvantaged or at-risk youth. Well, sure enough, what they found when they were able to show the students why math is important, because if you're a machine operator, you have to know the calculations. Mm -hmm. The kids not only uh, gravitated to that, all of a sudden now they're attending school, they're graduating, and many of them are, are going on to college. So these are kids that, under a rec regular academic setting, would have no way of, 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 of uh, obtaining upward mobility because they probably would have been filtered out, they would have been uh, 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 dropped out of school with very little skills. The program in Georgia was so successful 
that the company de developed another program just like it in Alabama. Hmm. And we can use that idea to, to focus on those youth that are having a hard time. The last thing I wanted to talk about is making post-secondary education more affordable. Uh, the program we've talked about is called MOOC. That is massive, open, online courses. Some of them have already been used over at MIT. What this does is allow a student who may not be able to afford to attend a university such as UMass Amherst. Because remember, UMass Amherst, the freshman class are getting like 43,000 applications for 5,200 spots. So many families can't get their kids to get in there. But under the MOOCs program, these kids would be able to take the courses, at least their prereqs, online and they would be able to save the money and cost of going there, and they would be able perhaps to graduate in three years, get their degree uh, sooner, and at less, less cost. Again, simple idea, it's already being used. Mm -hmm. All the state would have to do is provide the mechanism for, uh, ex uh, for the program to accept credit so that uh, someone who wanted to take advantage of that. So with ideas like this, we can, folk, we can target the youth that don't do very well in high school. We can make sure that uh, the kids in college have access to, to better schooling and affordability. And we can provide the excellence in education that every child in Massachusetts deserves. In, they should, we should, uh, the state government should be committed to making sure that every child in our state mm -hmm. has an excellent opportunity for education. And my job as a, 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 when I get elected would be to do exactly that. One of the things that I really like about what you've said <clears throat> is establishing the relevance of your classes. Right. And very often people who quote unquote underachieve are because they feel that they're just in class to kind of goof off because they don't, you know, geometry, what do I have to know from geometry? Sure. Or, or foreign language or any of these different disciplines, if they can be exposed to the real world and see the relevance of these particular classes. Now, this also whipsaws back to the educational programs themselves. Right. There has to be a lot more interaction with companies, sure, with different organizations who can kind of exp explain to the educators what it is that they need so that you're preparing kids who can actually think in a creative way and, not only that, and apply these, these bits of knowledge that they're learning. And Ron, we don't have to reinvent the wheel. We've seen it's it done. done. Yeah. Um, we can analyze data. One of the great things about having municipal government and state governments across the nation is we can analyze the data, see if that program works well for us, tweak it to our needs and concerns. And what's, what's more compelling is um, someone would say, well, how much money, how, where are we going to get the money? Our state budget has accumulated 40% growth in eight years, but zero growth in education and local aid. I don't know why, I think I have an idea why, the city officials and the municipal, municipal officials aren't raising a whole lot of hell as to why they're accepting this. Mm -hmm. They should be on the state senators and state representatives, and they should be telling them, we need to get the money that our children are entitled to. But you rarely hear that in public. Mm -hmm. And I've told, I told Ed, Ed Augustus, I told uh, other city councilors that I would expect them to be on my case, making sure that whatever money educators, the, the children and cities are entitled to, they get. Because if I can't get it for them, I'll find out who's hiding it. Because I don't know anybody, anything in Boston. Okay, I'm a, I'm a loose cannon <laughs> to that extent mm -hmm. because I'm not afraid to make waves and to, to, because I believe our folks in this district, in our state, deserve the best education possible. And I'm not going to let any special interests or any special group of power get in the way. You mentioned earlier that there were three basic areas that you wanted to explore. One was education. I think you've explained that quite well. You also wanted to talk about job creation. Yep. And you also, other than government job creation, because that's something they do real well, right. and uh, government efficiency and um, the, the quote-unquote transparency, which is nothing more than a buzzword right. in terms of what, what, what's happened. Yeah. I the, think, yeah, oh, I'm sorry. Ahead. No, no, please. I think, job creation. Yeah. This I want to hear about. Uh, I think the problem with the way things have been going on in the past is that our state senators and our state representatives are acting like venture capitalists instead of 
uh, legislators in coming up with programs that create jobs. Let me give you an example. Well we all said. knew what happened with Evergreen. You know, when, the, when, the, when we pick and choose an industry to favor over all the other industries, mm -hmm. and we, we are basically in the venture capital business picking winners and losers. Well, as we know, the Evergreen program didn't work out too well for us, okay? That's the solar panel company. Right, right. Yeah. Then the other example is the Life Sciences Initiative. Now, this, first of all, we love life sciences. We, we think that it's a very important field. We want to see it develop because it could, it could be for our, uh, the greater good. But the, the, the state decided to, to basically earmark $1 billion in state funds for the life sciences project to create jobs in life sciences. Well, the Pioneer Institute did an analysis, and they found that they stopped spending money after $525 million dollars because they could only create 571 jobs. For 525 million? million. That's about $929,000 per, per job. job. I imagine that you and I together, <clears throat> if they gave us that much money, we could probably create more than one job, okay? Probably, a, probably quite a few. <laughs> so when, when they take money from other ta citizens, other businesses, and, and decide that they're gonna pick one central business, and, they, and it fails, it costs the Commonwealth tremendous amounts of effort. Mm -hmm. Now, here's an alternative, and there's two ways, two things I want to talk about. One is we have to give the job creators an environment, a regulatory environment, to create jobs. And one of the first bills I'll introduce as your next state center for the first Worcester district is a, is a, a bill that would entitle the state for crowdfunding, an exemption to the investment under, it's called the crowdfunding exemption. Here's how it works. Um, right now, if you and I, uh, let's say you're running a business mm -hmm. and you were looking for investors, and I said, hey, I'll give you $5,000 to invest in your business um, for some equitable interest. Well, it, it's technically illegal unless I register as a registered investor and go through all the regulatory requirements and you go through all the, um, the SEC regulatory requirements. It's, it's cost prohibitive. However, if I take $5,000 and say, Hey, Ron, how about you and I going down to Foxwoods and blowing that money on, on, the, on, the, on the casinos? No problem. <clears throat> All right. So what is crowdfunding exemption? Crowdfunding allows local investors to invest in local businesses. It's already being done in many other states. And again, thinking outside the box, coming up with a turn of ideas, where the, the state would introduce a bill um, and a law that would allow, you know, increments of either five or 10,000 for local investors to invest in local businesses. Mm -hmm. And then if I, and then if you had a, if you had a good idea and I wanted to invest in it, I could do that legally. And it's been done in other states. And what it's found is that the uh, job creators, it's difficult for them, many of them to get access to capital. The crowdfunding exemption allows them to do that, allows local businesses to obtain capital relatively inexpensively for local jobs. It's intrastate, so it's not somebody outside of the state coming mm -hmm. in or us going outside. It's in our state. It's worked effectively. Again, we take what other states and mm -hmm. municipalities have done and we use it to our advantage. Now, take it one step further. Let's say that um, the Commonwealth wanted to create jobs and they were going to earmark, let's say, a billion dollars out of the uh, rainy day fund to do that. Now, instead of picking one industry of an old, or, or another, what if we said, listen, we're going to give $25,000 to any business in Massachusetts that creates one job that pays over $30,000 a year mm -hmm. with benefits and the job remains in place for at least a year. Well, if you take that $1 billion dollars and divide it by 25,000, there's a potential increase of 40,000 jobs. And the nice thing about that is that, that uh, uh, program, we don't have to worry about picking winners and losers. Everyone is on the, civil, on the same playing field, um, and the job creators will be able to create jobs. And that's what we need. If we want some forward thinking on job creation, the crowdfunding is the best mechanism because you don't have to worry about earmarking mo uh, money. And the other is to provide that regulatory environment. We need to get, understand that the people that create jobs in the private sector are, are the ones best suited to provide those jobs. 
let's not be venture capitalists. I'm not running as a venture capitalist. Mm -hmm. I don't even play one on TV, mm -hmm. okay? <laughs> I am running as a state legislator or state senator because I want the greatest number of jobs because those kids that are being educated, including my kid, my granddaughter, and your kids, and your grandchildren, and all the kids out there, and all their families and friends, if there are jobs here for them to take, they get to stay here. And, the, and we won't have our youth going all across the country. You know, Paul, not only is that an exciting concept, but it also feeds into a word that you don't hear very much anymore, entrepreneurial capabilities, right. entrepreneurship. A lot of young people, and maybe not so young people, have ideas and they'd like to start a little business, which, yeah. you know, Apple was a little business at one exactly. time, and Microsoft and all the rest of it. And because of the educational benefits that we have, particularly at the post-secondary level in this state, you've got a lot of brain power here. Yeah. And... You know, as I remember, Bill Gates, like, started here, or at least he, you know, went to Harvard for a couple of years and so forth, and the rest is history. How many other Bill Gates are out there? Right. And the, and the good thing about the crowdfunding exemption is that we don't have to pick the Bill Gates. We don't have to guess who's the winner or the loser. We allow the market to Let do it. Let the that. market do it. And, and we have every one of our um, business and entrepreneurial uh, citizens have equal access to uh, uh, um, acquiring capital to create jobs. I mean, like I said, a job is a job, whether it's created, whether it's a big high-tech bio mm -hmm. life science or if it's a mom and pop operation, the whole, the whole idea of upward mobility, giving everybody a chance to achieve their dreams is, an, is, is fulfilled when you provide that framework for jobs to grow. And again, sometimes you have to, you know, the government has to get out of the way, provide that environment, well and let the, the job creators work. And my, that will be my sole goal, is to make sure we have some change. Because I, I'm tired of watching the same thing over and over again. And I'll do whatever I can to, to make um, the, our goal of upward mobility for all students uh, come to fruition. The thing of it is, when you talk about the government, <clears throat> and specifically the state's government, you keep reading it seems every month there's a new survey that comes out that quantifies the state of Massachusetts, how it stands within the entire country in terms of being business friendly or not. And years ago, it was considered a very, very business friendly state, a great place to come to, start a business, work, whatever. Sure. And it's been sliding and sliding. I don't have the numbers off the top of my head. Yeah. But we're in the bottom half right now. I heard the one survey, for, we're the 47th out of 50 states in uh, business climate. In other words, we're at the bottom. We're at the bottom. And uh, it doesn't have to be that way. Historically, you know, our state has never been, you know, sitting on vast oil reserves or gas reserves. We've always been merchants. We've always been people mm -hmm. with technology who use our brains. And we've got the smartest people in the world. We have the, we're the technology center of the universe verse in so many ways. So we have to think forward. We have to think out of the box uh, so that we can make things work. And it's funny because when you think about that and you look how our state government operates, you would think we were in the dark ages. Mm -hmm. I mean, for example, one of the uh, 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 elements of our upward mobility program is efficient, transparent, and accountable government. Um, we, oh, for three. Oh, for three. <laughs> How about um, putting the laws online for a week before they're voted on and allowing folks to comment and analyze the data? Imagine that, reading a law before it's passed. And provide feedback to your representation. Right. A couple years Hello? ago, they, the, the state legislature passed a tech tax. They had to repeal it. It took nine months for the business community to convince the legislature that the bill itself the law itself was incomprehensible. It was, it was something they couldn't understand and they couldn't enforce. So we, we, we propose putting the bills online, putting the votes online so that I, as a state senator, have to go on record in committee and in the roll call where I stand. I should be able to take the heat. I should be able to stand up to my constituents mm -hmm. and say, I voted this way. I'm not going to hide behind closed doors. Do you know that our legislature last year voted to keep the votes quiet? 
to keep the votes quiet. Sure. I, I mean, it's just it's just amazing. And also, let's add sunset provisions. Let's let's make sure that when the laws are passed, that they come up for a periodic review to see if they met their their goal, their intended goals. Again, efficient, accountable, transparent government. That's probably the easiest thing for us to do. I'm sure there are powers in, uh, in Boston that don't want that. But in, in, unless we elect legislators like myself who are willing to toe the line mm -hmm. and to challenge the existing uh, um, establishment, it's going to be business as usual. And like I said, the definition of insanity is doing the same and, thing and over and over result. again <laughs> and expecting a different result. Well, I, I'm definitely a, a different result. You know, one of the first things that any of us learned in school as it relates to the pol political process was that absolute power corrupts absolutely. Perfect. And when you have any state like ours that is so one-sided, I mean, we're in a city of Worcester. There is currently not a single person who's in an elective position who's a Republican or an independent. Yes, I, I understand. In the city, in the city, yeah. There's, there's probably at least one that might be uh, well, evangelitis, but that's not strictly, right, right. you know, strictly Worcester, um, and and that that can become frightening because when you look at the way these folks vote, right? DeLeo, who runs the state, yeah. anything he wants, these folks just roll right over for it. And I think, and I think the reason why I mentioned earlier, why would city officials put up with? zero growth in education local aid for eight years while the budget balloons to 40 percent because they're afraid and yeah. I've, I've got confirmation that when someone in the local level steps out of line i'm telling i've told my local uh, city uh, um, counselors i would tell that to all the members of the selectmen and all the towns that hey you put me in there and get elected you're not getting what you're entitled to i expect you to come to my house on uh, technic square and uh, call me out on it Folks, you've heard what this man is all about, and he's real, okay? Ball is in your court on November 4th. Get him elected, and if you don't like what he does, throw him the hell out. <laughs> but get off your butts, check out what he's all about online, and then make your decision. And Paul, thanks again for joining us. Folks, thank thanks you for, for joining us, and uh, vote for Paul Franco. He's a good guy. He's a local guy. He deserves your vote. Very, very exciting platform. Very exciting. Thank you very much.